All right, everybody, let's get started. Good afternoon, folks. Welcome to the Lunchtime Discovery Series. My name is Chris. I am your host every Wednesday at noon for our very special program brought to you by the North Carolina Office of Environmental Education within the Department of Environmental Quality and us here at the North Carolina Museum of Natural Sciences. Thanks for joining us. Thanks for tuning in. Today is a super cool day. Uh, in fact, actually, this entire week is a pretty exciting week, especially for museum folks like us and in science and in nature focused people like we all are. Uh, this is Earth Sciences Week. That's right. So each day this week has a very special theme. And today's theme is near and dear to the hearts of any natural history museum person out there, I would imagine certainly for us here, and certainly for today's guest. Today is National Fossil Day. That's right. Happy National Fossil Day, everybody. Everybody's, uh, some people, a lot of people's favorite things to go look at when they come and visit our museum and museums worldwide. They want to see the fossils, want to see the old dead stuff that's been dug up from the ground or found, and we can learn so much from them. And right now, we're going to learn so much from one of these fossil experts. Today for Lunchtime Discovery, our guest is Dr. Christian Kammer. He's the research curator for paleontology at the Museum of Natural Sciences. Christian, welcome to the program. Thank you so much for having me, Chris. Happy National Fossil Day. It's a great day, right? Indeed. Especially for uh, a paleontology scientist, a paleontologist uh, like yourself, in a fabulous Fossil Day a shirt, it looks like. Uh, it, yes. That's fantastic. I love that. All right. Well, let's jump right in. Christian, I'll let you take it away. Sure thing. Um, so yeah, this year's National Fossil Day is in particular celebrating the Permian fossils of Guadalupe Mountains National Park uh, on the outskirts of El Paso, Texas at the Texas-New uh, Mexico border. Um, preserves a really unparalleled view of what's going on in marine ecosystems in the Permian period, which is back in the Paleozoic era. So with that in mind, uh, I wanted to talk about uh, what's going on at the end of the Permian, uh, which is one of the biggest events in Earth history, uh, the end Permian mass extinction, uh, sort of what it is, how it came about, and what it means for us today. So getting right into the talk here, let me bring this up. Um, can you see everything all right, Chris? Looks great to me. Okay, so yeah, talking about the end Permian mass extinction uh, and how it was kind of the end of the world. Um, so uh, extinction is very much you know, on our minds. Uh, it is sort of an accepted fact of of our current age, uh, that extinction is happening. Uh, we know there are species like the dodo bird, the passenger pigeon, uh, the Tasmanian tiger, or the quagga uh, that have gone extinct. Uh, they are totally extirpated and short of uh, some remarkable sort of advances in cloning, they are, they are not coming back. Uh, so it is, it can be a little hard to imagine that extinction as a concept is a relatively recent addition to human understanding. Uh, really only slightly older than concepts like uh, evolution and around the same age as things like cells. Uh, so for much of uh, Western thought, at least, uh, there was the idea of uh, the scala naturi, or the great chain of being, uh, which went back to originally to Plato and Aristotle, these Greek philosophers, uh, but was really cemented uh, during the Renaissance age as the idea that you know, there is this hierarchy of things on Earth from minerals to plants to animals to humans, and then up to a benevolent creator who would not allow any of his creations to, to pass from the Earth, basically to go extinct. Um, and that it was impossible for any entire group of animals or plants uh, to disappear entirely from the Earth. Everything was sort of in, in perfect balance. Um, now, Things like fossils were known, uh, so it was known that there was life in, in the past, uh, but for the most part, they were things like shells that were just thought to be 
like older versions of animals that were still alive. Uh, fossils have been known by you know, peoples of all inhabited continents since time immemorial, uh, but for the most part, they were not recognized as being extinct organisms. Uh, things like uh, these fossil gastropods here, you can see it and say, oh, okay, well, that's, that's a, a shell that lives in the ocean somewhere, and maybe it's just somewhere slightly different. Uh, things started to change in the late 17th century, uh, where you started to re-identify some structures that previously were considered inorganic as fossils. Uh, famously, you have this image by the Danish uh, naturalist Nicholas Steno from 1667, where he recognized that these structures on the bottom there, these triangular structures, uh, which were called glossopetri by classical scholars, um, were in fact fossil shark's teeth. So previously, uh, these were considered, they were called tongue stones. Um, people had a lot of different, often fanciful explanations for where they came from. The famed uh, Roman scholar, uh, Pliny the Elder, thought that they fell from the moon. Um, other uh, naturalists believed that they just grew naturally within the earth. Uh, Steno's uh, contemporary, uh, German naturalist Athanasius Kircher, thought that they were the result of a, a lapid uh, lapidifying force diffusing through the geocosm, that they were these, the earth itself was sort of growing teeth. Um, all of this, you know, is, we know nowadays is, is very, very wrong, uh, that these were indeed fossils. Um, this was some of the first evidence that there are, uh, there were completely lost uh, species. Um, but still, you know, we have sharks today. So uh, a lot of the arguments were that these, if we found a fossil, it, you know, there must still be some representatives of that species somewhere on earth. Um, and especially from sort of a Eurocentric viewpoint at this time, where sort of like broader exploration of the world is starting to happen and new species are being found everywhere, you can, you could always argue that, oh, okay, we just haven't found the part of the world where this species is still around. Um, as some examples of that, uh, also in sort of in the late 1600s, you have on the left, this giant Nautilus uh, presented to the Royal Society in England by the pioneering microscopist, Robert Hooke, uh, much bigger than any modern Nautilus. Uh, and also Nautilus is not known to exist in England, but you can say, okay, these Nautiluses live in the deep sea somewhere in the Pacific Ocean. Surely if we, we search enough, we'll find it. Um, on the right, these giant antlers uh, found by Sir Thomas Molyneux, a, an Irish physician. Uh, he said that they were from a moose, uh, moose not known to live in Ireland these days, uh, but you know, moose clearly still in Northern Europe and America. So uh, these are all species that are somewhere out there still in the world. Uh, now, of course, we know that this is not true. These are both extinct species. The giant Nautilus is an, an ammonite uh, from the Mesozoic era. The supposed moose is this animal, Megaloceros, a type of giant deer often called the Irish elk. Um, but at, back then, sort of at the beginning of paleontology, uh, the, this was an acceptable explanation. Um, Thomas Jefferson also got in the mix with this, uh, with this fossil. So. Jefferson, you know, uh, has worn many hats in American history, president, philosopher, slave owner, and uh, paleontologist, one of the first paleontologists uh, working in the US. And uh, he was given these claws that were found in a cave in what is now West Virginia, and he named them megalonics, which in Greek simply means big claw. Um, they are huge. And this was, he argued that they were from a gigantic species of lion that in keeping with this idea of great chain of being was still alive somewhere on earth. Um, now, of course, we don't know of any really gigantic lions anywhere, uh, but at this point, a lot of the, the Western interior of the United States was still uh, unexplored uh, by you know, colonial settlers. And he thought it might still be out there. And indeed he asked Lewis and Clark uh, when they were exploring the Louisiana Purchase to keep an eye peeled for megalonics because he thought it was still somewhere uh, in the US. And this is actually part of a broader fight he had with uh, assorted um, gentlemen scientists in Europe. 
who argued that the American fauna was sort of depauperate and sort of weak and pitiful compared to the, the old world animals. And so TJ was like, no, there's still, there's a gigantic lion somewhere out there that is bigger than anything in Europe or Africa or Asia. Um, unfortunately for him, uh, he got this pretty wrong. There was an amazing animal that lived in North America, but Megalonyx we know is a giant ground sloth uh, that went extinct at the end of the ice age. It wasn't a giant lion, um, but rather a, a relative of the, the living tree sloths in South America today. Um, so the idea that uh, there were these animals that were totally lost was really uh, first uh, brought up and then later proven by uh, Georges Cuvier, or to give him his title, the Baron Cuvier, uh, exactly the sort of European noble naturalist uh, that Jefferson hated. Uh, but in this case, uh, you know, he was the premier anatomist of his day, uh, definitely one of the founders of paleontology as a science. And something that he noted was that a lot of these, you know, fossils that are being found in the late 1600s and then into the 1700s when he was working, um, they aren't quite like the living things. So those antlers, they don't quite look like a moose. That shell doesn't quite look like a nautilus. Those claws don't quite look like a lion. And he showed this uh, most extensively in studying the mammoth remains from the Paris basin. So you can see in this lithograph on the right, he looked very carefully at all the features of these mammoth fossils um, and show that they are not just extinct elephants, but they are a different species, a different genus, something that does not exist at all today. Um, and the idea that there were entire sort of species and groups of animals uh, that are missing led to this idea of extinction. Uh, that led Cuvier to say, you know, all of these facts consistent among themselves and not opposed by any report seem to me to prove the existence of a world previous to ours destroyed by some kind of catastrophe. Um, this idea of extinction was born out moving into the 1800s uh, as really weird fossil creatures, unlike, clearly unlike anything living today that didn't require you know, the anatomical skill of a Cuvier to show that you know, it's not an elephant. Once they started finding giant reptiles from the Mesozoic era, uh, marine reptiles like this Plesiosaurus found by the, the famous fossil hunter uh, Mary Anning in southern England, um, flying reptiles like Pterodactylus, uh, this fossil first found in the, the 1700s, um, but proven to be an extinct type of reptile by Cuvier in 1800 in, uh, this is from Bavaria. Uh, and of course, the first dinosaurs, uh, things like Iguanodon found in 1823, initially from these very fragmentary remains, um, but later from complete skeletons in Belgium that showed that there were these whole big groups of organisms that are, that are clearly not present anywhere on Earth. Like we'd know if, if dinosaurs were out there. Um, so extinction became uh, you know, basically settled science that it exists uh, in the first half of the 19th century. Uh, but there was still a big debate going on as to the mechanisms and the rates behind it. Was, as Cuvier said, uh, extinctions caused by these massive, potentially global catastrophes be they floods or volcanoes, uh, earthquakes, tsunamis, um, or as argued by many prominent geologists of the time, was it more gradual? So uh, Charles Lyell, uh, who was a, a geologist working uh, at around the same time, uh, he restudied Cuvier's uh, work on the Paris Basin and showed quite conclusively that it was not, there's no evidence of a giant flood there it seems just like the regular geological processes, very slow moving erosion and changes in rivers that we see today, which is called uniformitarianism. Uh, and Lyell instead argued that extinction is real, species go extinct, but it's a very gradual process caused by long-term protracted changes in local climate or food availability or uh, competition between or predation between different, different species, much like we see in the modern day. Um, and this idea really held sway among scientists for, you know, 100 years or more after that, that extinction is gradual, it's always going on in the background, but there generally aren't these major catastrophes. Um, however, when you look at the time scale, uh, so this is the looking at mostly on the right there, that's the Phanerozoic, that's the age of complex life, uh, which is break in, broken up into the Paleozoic, the Mesozoic, and the Cenozoic eras. 
the breaks between these eras per and periods are mostly based on different animals and plants being alive at those times. So we know there are characteristic types of animals that live in the Paleozoic, and they're different from the ones in the Mesozoic, which are different from the ones in the Cenozoic. And those, the breaks are actually pretty abrupt at the borders between them, suggesting that it's not just you know, a constant smear of background extinction, but that there are major extinctions, so-called mass extinctions, happening in the fossil record. And this was finally demonstrated uh, rigorously and quantitatively by uh, two American paleontologists, David Raup and Jack Sipkowski, uh, in the late 70s and early 80s, uh, that show of the, of, that's the 1970s and 1980s, I should say, um, who showed that there are these things called mass extinctions. And the, specifically, there are the big five. Uh, these are the uh, uniquely gigantic mass extinctions in Earth history. So looking at this plot here, this is a, a map of uh, genus diversity of marine invertebrates through time. And you can see that there are these re really deep gouges in them uh, that correspond to much higher than just mere background extinction rates. And there's clearly something catastrophic going on. Um, the other thing around the same time that really sort of vindicated some of Cuvier's ideas of there being catastrophic extinction was evidence for what's happening at the end of the Mesozoic, the end of the age of dinosaurs. This is the Cretaceous Paleogene extinction. Um, one, an enormous buried crater, the Chicxulub Crater, was found on the edge of the Yucatan Peninsula in Mexico. Um, also work by a uh, father and son team of physicists and geologists, uh, Luis and Walter Alvarez, uh, found evidence for a bolide impact due to iridium, which is a, an element that is very rare on Earth, but very abundant in outer space in the asteroid belt. Um, suggesting that there was uh, either a comet or what we now know to be an asteroid that hit the Earth, and indeed it hit uh, in this impact crater in Mexico. Um, and so this has, in subsequent years, really been uh, you know, extensively studied and seems to be the smoking gun that there was the extinction of the, the non-bird dinosaurs, the non-avian dinosaurs, was caused by an asteroid of enormous size, more than a mile in diameter, diameter uh, impacting the Earth. Um, and so direct evidence that Cuvier was at least to a degree right, that their mass extinctions do occur and they are caused by global catastrophes. Um, and this bolide impact at the end of the Cretaceous is probably the best known of all the mass extinctions, certainly to, to the public, um, because of its role in extinguishing sort of dinosaurian rule over the Earth. Uh, but it's not the biggest mass extinction in Earth history. Um, when you look at sort of which of those valleys, those troughs, brings the number of genera closest to zero, uh, it's this one. It's at the end of the Paleozoic era, the end of the Permian period, between the Permian and the Triassic. Um, indeed, this was such a uh, terrible event, uh, so destructive, uh, that it's been called like the great dying. Sometimes there's, there's this book that said when life nearly died. Um, that's probably a bit hyperbolic. There was never a real worry that like life as a, as a whole would go extinct. Like there's always gonna be some bacteria out there, um, at least until the earth is consumed by the sun. Uh, but it's true that you know most of animals at this time were in very, very bad shape. And so what kind of animals were they? Um, well, it's a bunch of uh, texts that are not really seen much nowadays. Uh, most of them are lost entirely. So uh, it's been estimated up to 95% of marine species. That's sort of the maximum lower end, maybe 80% of marine species. Uh, and then 70% of terrestrial species were lost in the end Permian mass extinction, uh, which is a, it's a huge number. Like imagine if 95% of all like animals in the ocean just died. Uh, that's what you're looking at at this time. Um, and it is, it's not just, you know, individual organisms or individual species, but it's whole larger groups of these things, like what if birds went extinct, for instance. Um, so bring this back also to talking about this is uh, in relation to National Fossil Day celebrating uh, Guadalupe Mountains National Park, uh, which has these, these Permian reefs. So this, this is a view of the world before the extinction, everything going really well uh, in the ocean. 
Uh, but you'll see it's a lot of types of animals that you don't see nowadays uh, that have been, been lost to extinction over time. Um, the fish are relatively small and primitive. Uh, there are a lot more shelled uh, cephalopod mollusks. Um, and there's also all of these totally extinct groups. So nowadays we have stony corals, um, the scleractinians. Uh, back then they had these rugose corals or what are called horn corals. Um, this group and all the others that I'll be showing are things that were lost that went extinct at the end Permian. Um, nowadays, most of the shelly animals in the ocean are mollusks, so things like clams and snails. Uh, back then, those, those animals did exist, uh, but the majority of the, the shelled fauna uh, are these, this group called the brachiopods. So there are still living brachiopods. Um, you'll find them some of them in mud, uh, some of them sort of like on rocky coasts uh, in the Pacific. Um, but they're, they're generally pretty rare. Uh, but in the Permian, you have these whole big groups, you know, thousands and thousands of fossils known, um, and entire, entire groups of them, like these are the productive and the orthid brachiopods were wiped out entirely by the extinction. Uh, there were also a lot more of these stalked echinoderms, things like the crinoids are the only living representatives, and you only see stalked forms in the deep sea. Uh, but you also have these groups like cystoids and blastoids. So this is, that's the calyx of a blastoid. That's the tip where the feeding tentacles were. And then it's on this long stalk that's sort of rooted to the ground. It's a filter feeding marine animal. Um, a lot of the mobiles, so not just the, the sessile uh, marine vertebrates go extinct at this time. The, the noble trilobite, one of the best known of all fossils known throughout the Paleozoic finally gives up the ghost as a result of the Permian extinction although they had been on the decline for a while before then. Uh, you also see the loss of the Eurypterids. These are the sea scorpions, some of which achieved enormous size up to you know, 15 feet in length. Um, the last one of those go extinct at the Permo-Triassic and a lot of the shelled cephalopods as well. So particularly this whole group of ammonites, the goniotites go extinct now. And you have only a, a handful of species that are sort of surviving into the Triassic. Although that group at least does go on to then re-diversify. And so you get all these ammonites coexisting with marine reptiles in the age of dinosaurs. Um, marine vertebrates also uh, very badly uh, suffering from this. So you have uh, groups like the acanthodians, sometimes called the spiny sharks, uh, which include some of the ancestors of modern, modern chondrichthians, modern sharks and rays. Uh, this group goes extinct at the boundary. Uh, you also have these very weird chondrichthians, the eugenodontids. So what you're seeing here, it may look like an ammonite shell, may look like a coiled shell, but it's actually the tooth whorl of one of these uh, big predatory chondrichthians. So historically, they were called sharks. Uh, recent research suggests they're more closely related to uh, ratfish, uh, the chimeras. Um, it would have been very shark-like in habitus uh, and certainly would have been powerful predators. Um, things like Helicoprion, which is one of these uh, Permian taxa, also grew enormous in size. Uh, this is a life-size restoration of one sort of a larger Helicoprion. And some of its close relatives like Edestis were equal or perhaps even larger in size. So the Eugenodonids, they actually did survive into the Triassic, um, but at pretty diminished, uh, uh, pretty diminished numbers. And they sort of blink out later into the, the Mesozoic. Um, so these marine fossils, you know, they're known very nicely in Texas and they're known worldwide, uh, but the, the exact moment of the extinction is uh, best represented uh, by a really beautiful check section in Meishan in South Central China. Um, it just has these, these really beautifully exposed uh, strata uh, in a bunch of sort of box canyons uh, that s span the gap between the Permian and the Triassic period. So that's where the the golden spike is put. So golden spike, it's a stratigraphic concept. It's the uh, global stratotype section and point. So that is the, uh, it's, it's used as reference for the, the border between two geological periods. So that's exactly where we say the, uh, the, the Permian ends and the Triassic begins. Um, and it, the, the stratigraphy is really beautifully worked out. There's been decades of work um, by stratigraphers and paleontologists looking at this site such that they've been able to pinpoint uh, the border between these two, uh, between sub beds B and C 
within bed 27 of this sequence, uh, which is uh, sometime into the mass extinction. Um, but it's the border between these two index taxa between Hindiotis uh, changshinensis and Hindiotis parvus. So these index taxa, um, these are fossils that ideally are very abundant and are found worldwide so that we know when Hindiotis parvus shows up that you're in the Triassic. And so they're found on lots of continents, um, but very, uh, very detailed record here. Um, these uh, index fossils, Hindiotis, they're what are called conodonts. For many, many years, they were only known from these isolated uh, tooth bits. And it was a mystery what the conodont animal actually looked like. Uh, and so it was thought for a while that they were actually like types of worms or maybe mollusks. So it was actually very surprising when a complete conodont animal was found and it turned out to be an early vertebrate. So an animal, you know, including ourselves and birds and reptiles and fish. And actually it seems like conodonts are more closely related to us and to other bony fish uh, than they are to lampreys and hagfish, the living jawless fish. Um, conodonts, very weird looking animals. You, the actual conodont uh, elements, the, the teeth uh, were arranged like this inside the mouth of these things. Um, very bizarre looking, but they were incredibly common uh, parts of marine ecosystems for, for much of the, the Paleozoic and even, then even into the Triassic. Um, and indeed, uh, at the geopark that has been set up around the Maishan section, there are these monuments to Hindiotis parvus, which I think are absolutely amazing and would like to see a lot, a lot more of that uh, sort of, you know, statues celebrating some, some famous fossils, especially those that are maybe more obscure than dinosaurs. So the marine permatrassic extinction, very well understood. Uh, what's going on in the terrestrial realm? So if you're at all familiar with Permian animals, you're probably thinking of things like these, some of these giant dragonflies, like two foot dragonflies, or this sail backed predatory proto mammal, Dimetrodon. Um, but these are not animals that were involved in the mass extinction. So these are living in the, the earliest Permian. They are long extinct uh, due to other reasons by the time the extinction happens. Uh, rather, the primary victims of the extinction among terrestrial animals. Uh, are a more advanced group of proto-mammals, the therapsids, um, which include some of these very large saber-toothed types, uh, which I'll discuss in just a moment. Um, so these are uh, also synapsids, so they are, they are proto-mammals like Dimetrodon, but they're, they're a group more closely related to mammals, the therapsids. Uh, this is the group that I specialize in. Most of my research is done on synapsids. Um, their fossils are found worldwide, and they are incredibly abundant. So particularly this group, the Dicynodonts, uh, these tusked, beaked herbivores, sort of uh, very diverse, known from thousands of specimens, ranging from sort of pig to elephant sized, uh, also known from all over the world. And then uh, their primary predators, the Gorgonopsians, which are these, these in some cases, very large saber-toothed animals. Um, Taxa like Rubigia and Inostrancevia uh, were equal or greater to sort of like polar bear sized, so definitely some of the most formidable uh, carnivores of their day. And indeed, that has brought them a small amount, not dinosaur levels amount, um, but a small amount of sort of broader pop cultural notoriety. You'll occasionally see a Gorgonopsian appear uh, in, in the broader culture. Uh, and I certainly hope to see more and more public interest in this amazing group. Um, so like I said, these are also known worldwide, uh, but the fossils uh, much like you know, the, the Chinese Meishan section is the best record of uh, the marine invertebrates. Um, this part of South Africa called the Karoo Basin, uh, which covers actually two thirds of the land area of South Africa, it's very extensive, uh, is the best record of uh, the terrestrial Permo-Triassic extinction. Um, and the stratigraphy of the Karoo Basin has been worked out in really exquisite detail. Uh, there was a uh, special memoir published uh, just this year uh, looking at the, the ages and sort of the changes in rocks and the faunas uh, going through the Karoo Basin um, from the late Permian into the Triassic. Uh, lots of exposure of the stratigraphy there. So we actually, again, have a can pinpoint with a good deal of accuracy uh, when the extinction is starting and sort of like what's going on in terms of the geology associated with that extinction. Um, and what we see is there is a shift from uh, what seem to be relatively wet environments with these big saber-toothed carnivores and lots of herbivores of many sizes uh, to a much drier ecosystem 
in the Triassic, much more arid. And that seems to be what we're seeing worldwide uh, is that it's, it's becoming hotter, it's becoming drier, the animals are becoming smaller. Um, and in the Karoo, at least, also there, it's, it's interesting, there's this one particular genus of Dicynodont, Lystrosaurus, starts to become super abundant at the very end of the Permian, and then uh, is also abundant in the Triassic. Uh, and just to show that this is not uh, only going on in the Karoo Basin, there's very recent work that came out last year showing a similar turnover in the latest Permian in the Ordo space, and this is also in China. And basically everywhere uh, we have terrestrial records of the, the Permo-Triassic boundary, there seems to be a pretty sharp cutoff where we're losing lots and lots of species and indeed whole groups of animals uh, of various terrestrial groups. Um, so what caused this? Uh, and the, there are a lot of sort of, there's a lot of background to that and it's a pretty complicated question, um, but the shortest answer is volcanoes. Uh, this is another case where Cuvier seems to have been correct and that there was a pretty catastrophic event going on. Uh, and it's what's called the Siberian Traps, Trappian Volcanism. So imagine if you will, if look at the map to the left there, uh, everything that's sort of like outlined in black, uh, that is evidence of lava at the end of the Permian. So basically this is a super volcano that was covered in most of what is now Siberia. Uh, a total of 3 million square miles covered in lava, uh, a total actually of 1 million, it's been estimated, cubic miles. So imagine a cube, uh, one mile by one mile by one mile, uh, that much volume of lava exuded uh, from the earth at this time. Um, so it's thought this was the result of a mantle plume, basically a, a superheated part of the, the molten center of the earth uh, rising up higher than it usually does and melting the, the overlying crust. Um, but you can imagine how catastrophic this would have been for everything living, basically everything living in Asia or Europe at the time. Um, and just to show you sort of like where on the map uh, this would have happened. So this is the Earth in end Permian times with the modern continents overlain on it. So you can get an idea of sort of what was going on. So you can see North America there to the left. Um, and then it's still attached to Africa and South America. And so this Trappian volcanism was happening in some, the Northern Hemisphere, uh, even back then in what is now Siberia. Um, and just to situate yourself for some of the other regions I've talked about, that Meishan, uh, uh, Chinese marine invertebrate fauna is found around here. And then the Karoo Basin where you get all those uh, synapsids is found down here. Um, so with that in mind, uh, you might ask, well, okay, uh, May, I can see that if they're like all of Siberia is just covered in lava, that these poor conodonts living in the sea next to it are probably going to die. Um, but these dicynodonts and gorgonopsians and stuff, they're living all the way on the opposite side of the earth. Surely they're not getting melted by lava. Uh, so why are they going extinct? Um, and this has to deal with the uh, sort of the, the ultimate causes of the mass extinction, which is the the uh, the supervolcano is just a driver of what ended up being uh, later instability. Um, and one, like it's, uh, it's worth keeping in mind how even one volcano, the amount of an effect it can have on the world at large. So you may remember uh, a few years ago, um, this volcano in Iceland, uh, Eyjafjalla Jökull was erupting very consistently and that basically all air travel to and from Europe was uh, canceled for, for weeks and weeks um, because it was, you know, ash was being spread all over uh, that part of the globe. Um, going further back to an even more destructive, but again, just a single volcanic eruption, not the thousands of years of constant volcanic eruption like the Siberian traps. Um, in 1883, you have the eruption of Krakatoa, still one of the most destructive uh, volcanic events for which there is any record uh, in human history. Um, and in addition to sort of destroying 70% of the, uh, the land mass of the island and causing tsunamis that killed you know, upwards of 30,000 people uh, in surrounding parts of Indonesia and Malaysia, um, it also uh, changed the Earth's climate for years. So it's been estimated that uh, as a result of the sulfur dioxide that Krakatoa put up into the atmosphere, global temperatures dropped by 0.4 degrees uh, centigrade uh, for some time afterwards. Um, so it is possible for these volcanic events to have major changes to Earth's climate. 
Um, of course, you know, that was sort of a weird circumstance that a volcano caused global cooling. What we think is happening in the Permian is instead global warming. So the trap in uh, volcanoes were releasing huge amounts of carbon and specifically carbon dioxide that were you know, previously embedded in the earth uh, into the atmosphere. So carbon dioxide, well known as a greenhouse gas, uh, driving this global warming event. Um, and you can see that uh, in between the maps of late Permian Earth and then early Triassic Earth. So late Permian Earth is what we call an ice house world. So there are, there are large glaciers. Um, the poles are quite cold. So we are currently in sort of an ice house world right now. Um, and Triassic is hot house. So the glaciers have all melted, sea levels have risen. Uh, the equator is, has largely become desert. So you can see, you know, there are some desert belts in the Permian, but there's also, you know, these mountains, a lot of uh, greenery near the equator. Uh, and the Triassic, those deserts have expanded uh, quite to quite large size. Um, and so what happens here is there's a feedback loop that where you get from global warming started by the volcanoes into runaway global warming uh, caused by release of uh, greenhouse gases elsewhere in the geosphere. Um, so just this is a uh, sort of an overview of what's going on. Um, and it starts out with these, the Siberian traps, uh, volcanoes releasing carbon dioxide, driving up uh, global temperatures initially, you know, by not that much, uh, initially like first by one degree centigrade, and then sort of by the end of the, uh, of the Trappian volcanism by five degrees centigrade, which actually is a lot. Um, and the ocean absorbs most of that heat. Uh, and what happens is once the ocean uh, starts to be sort of hot throughout, or at least warm, you lose ocean currents. So ocean currents are related to uh, differing um, temperatures between the upper part and the lower part of the ocean, between the surface of the ocean and the air. Um, and so once those have been sort of like stabilized as generally pretty warm, uh, the sea starts to stagnate. Um, and within these hot oceans, uh, then you start getting the really bad greenhouse gases, things like methane being released uh, from things like methane hydrates, which are these uh, hexagonal, basically methane trapped in ice down on the ocean floor. So there's an example uh, on the left there of what this looks like nowadays. There's plenty of methane trapped in the deep ocean. Uh, and once those start to be released, it's, it's too late. Uh, the global warming just goes out of control, uh, raises uh, several more degrees centigrade, and you get to the point where the equator is actually so hot, it's basically uninhabitable. Uh, so you can see this in a, uh, this is, these are paleoclimate and paleooxygen estimates for what's going on at the Permo-Triassic. Um, and they show, they show changes, they don't show absolute temperatures. So for example, in the, the upper left there, you can see uh, the, the really dark red is the greatest uh, rise in temperature. And so this is mostly in the higher temperate regions and at the poles, because uh, they were cold beforehand and then uh, they're, they're warming up and the, the glaciers are, have melted completely. Uh, there is that band of increase like right on the equator, uh, which is what has been sort of dubbed the, the uninhabitable belt, uh, where you know, things sort of like directly in the tropics uh, just would have been too hot for most most animals to live in. Um, and that's corresponding also to a lack of oxygen. So on the bottom right there, uh, that's a drop in oxygen in the atmosphere and in the ocean. And so you have these big anoxic or hypoxic parts of the world where there are whole sections of ocean basin that have, have no oxygen. So basically no, nothing other than anaerobic bacteria can survive there. And even in the, the atmosphere on land, there's not enough oxygen for a lot of species uh, to exist. Um, so what was surviving in this sort of like post-apocalyptic hellscape of a world? Uh, well, there were some things, uh, notably this animal Lystrosaurus, which I've brought up before. Um, so Lystrosaurus uh, was this dicynodont, this herbivore, um, and it was enormously successful uh, during and in the wake of the extinction. So for whatever reason, when we're still not quite sure, Lystrosaurus was incredibly well adapted to dealing with these highly disrupted ecosystems. Um, and uh, I will also note Lystrosaurus, historically a rather obscure creature, uh, but I was recently informed that it will be appearing in the, the next Jurassic World sequel, apparently suffering from COVID, poor little thing. Um, but you know, if any, 
if any animal can survive a global catastrophe, uh, we know it's Lystrosaurus, so I'm sure it'll be fine. Um, but so Lystrosaurus makes up between 70 and 90% of all vertebrate fossils found in these early Triassic sites. So just thousands and thousands of them. It's really, it would have been a world just covered in these sort of like squat pig-like creatures as far as the eye can see. Um, they're not totally unaffected by the extinction though. I think that is important to note. Uh, they do suffer from what's called the Lilliput effect. So this is named after the, uh, the part of Gulliver's travels where you know Gulliver goes to this country where everyone is really tiny, the Lilliputians. Um, and so this is describing a pretty well-known effect uh, following extinctions that animals tend to get smaller and organisms in general tend to get smaller. These are shelly protozoans called foraminiferans. And this is actually showing what's happening at the end of the age of dinosaurs at the Cretaceous Paleogene event. So you have these you know, big happy forams uh, earlier on in the Cretaceous. And then as they start to get stressed during the extinction, you see smaller and smaller body size. And then following the extinction, they're all really tiny. Um, and you see the same thing in the Permian, looking at snails and clams, all the ones after the extinction are much smaller. And this makes sense because, you know, animals need, uh, they need food to grow. And if the ecosystem is very bad and they're under a lot of stress, uh, they can't eat as much. There is less food for, out there for them to consume. And so they need to stay smaller if they're going to survive. Um, it's too energetically expensive to be big. Uh, and you see this in Lystrosaurus as well. So the Permian species, Lystrosaurus macegai, is sort of a hippo-sized animal. Um, the early Triassic ones, they're much smaller. They're sort of max pig-sized and, and usually sort of like, you know, some badger-sized things. Um, another thing that's important to note here with Lystrosaurus and all of the therapsids that actually survive into the Triassic, uh, it's the survivors seem to have been found in burrows. Like these were animals that were burrowing underground. So you see this in the Triassic Lystrosaurus. You also see this in Cynodonts, which is another group of therapsids. This is actually the one that uh, eventually evolves into mammals. So these are some of our own ancestors, this Cynodont group. Um, and we know that they were living in burrows because uh, there are beautiful fossils like this. This is an exceptional uh, specimen that was actually a, a complete burrow that they looked at with the synchrotron scanner in, uh, in Grenoble. Um, and found that it was a whole uh, cynodont curled up next to this whole amphibian that were sharing a burrow together. Um, so why might burrowing be important? Well, if you're losing oxygen worldwide and it's becoming hard to breathe, uh, animals that already live underground have to deal with that all the time. Like moles and like mole rats, these other things that are living deep in burrows, at any given time, their burrow might collapse and they might be like stuck breathing bad air, stale air for long periods of time until they can dig their way out. So they need to be pre-adapted to dealing with low oxygen conditions. Um, so if you were already burrowing before the extinction, you have a better chance of surviving that dip in oxygen. Uh, it also means that you're not exposing yourself uh, to you know, global fires, to the extreme heat of the day. There are a lot of reasons why being a burrower would be good in a catastrophically warmed world. Um, and so we see that in a lot of the survivors. Um, of course, life did survive. And indeed, the extinction, it was good in a sense in that it allowed, if you're members of these groups of extinct animals uh, and, and modern animals, uh, that it basically is sort of like cleared the slate. Like all the groups that were dominant in the Permian tended to be wiped out. And it allowed new groups of organisms to diversify and take over. Uh, that empty eco space, even though that was a very, I should emphasize that was a very protracted uh, phase. It took, you know, maybe estimated between five and 10 million years uh, for ecosystems to recover from this event. Um, but those that did went on to be things like mammals. So the cynodonts evolved into mammals by the end of the Triassic. Um, amphibamiforms, which are a group of fossil amphibians. Uh, they gave rise to modern frogs and salamanders in the Triassic. Um, and then this group of early archosauromorphs, which are these large carnivorous reptiles, uh, they diversified into uh, two major groups, the crocodilians, which are still around today, and the dinosaurs, which we have today in the form of birds. So all of these groups, which are still very important members of the modern faunas, can thank the Permatrassic extinction for basically uh, opening up the way for them to, to diversify. Um, 
We also see a lot of the, the later Mesozoic groups like mar marine reptiles, like the ichthyosaurs and plesiosaurs, and then uh, a lot of invertebrate groups uh, like crustaceans um, and mollusks, and a lot of the fish groups really start to take off uh, moving into the Triassic. So also um, having cleared out a lot, of the, a lot of the brachiopod groups, a lot of the other extinct shelly fauna um, opening the way there. So again, upsides of the mass extinction. Uh, and just to give you an idea of like the incredible amount of diversity that you do see later in the Triassic, all these weird and wonderful marine and some even aerial organisms. And then of course, all the diversity of the terrestrial dinosaurs uh, throughout the end of the Mesozoic until they themselves get wiped out by the asteroid impact and then the mammals take over. Um, so there is, you know, there's silver linings to all this. Um, but so what, but what does all of this mean for us? Uh, so we know extinction is happening today. Can we learn from the Permo Triassic event? And I would say uh, yes, and we should be thinking about that uh, quite intensely, in fact. Uh, so we know that the Earth is currently warming. Um, evidence for this is, is quite clear. And it's very good that this is being driven by the release of greenhouse gases by human activities. Um, so, and this is, you know, it's not, you think back to this figure here where different parts of the earth are warming at different rates versus the ocean and the land. And there's uh, changes in sort of the amount of uh, temperature raised between say the equator and the Arctic. And that's also what we're seeing right now. So this is just what has happened earlier this year. And you'll note that there are, there are parts of the US that are seeing averages, but most of it is above average. And then you get these little blebs moving into the tropics like you'll see in South Florida uh, that are uh, far outside of the normal range and are all like year after year as hot as it's ever been, uh, hotter than it has ever been. Uh, I'm from Florida uh, and yeah, it's, it's a hot state, always was. Um, but like I remember being a kid in, the, in July's there, you'd get you know, maybe 80 degrees, 90 degrees on average. And recent years has been over 100, over 110 every year. Um, so they're, they're, these things, uh, they seem to be uh, changing in different parts. And also the rate at which these things are occurring is increasing, which is worrying, especially when we also start to consider oceanic currents and things like oxygen amounts. Um, already oxygen dead zones are starting to pop up, <clears throat> excuse me, in places like the Gulf of Mexico. And there's reason to be worried about these expanding uh, to other uh, sort of interior basins like the Mediterranean and eventually to the open ocean. So if we think back to sort of what's going on in the promo Triassic mass extinction, you start out with the release of all that CO2 from volcanoes. That was over tens of thousands of years that those volcanoes did that. Um, we've managed to uh, kick up global temperatures by one degree centigrade after just a hundred years of industrial activity. Um, but so we're still, you know, things are, are bad, but it's not in the runaway zone yet. Uh, but there's the real fear that if things go too much further, it is going to be impossible to stop uh, some of the more potent greenhouse gases like methane uh, from coming out and, you know, basically making a lot of, of the earth uh, very unlivable. Um, there is some evidence uh, that this might already be happening. So there's uh, been a lot of work now looking at methane seeps under the Arctic. Um, and yeah, sure, there's a lot of methane coming up, but we don't have baselines for this. So, you know, just the fact that the bubbles are coming up isn't cause for total freak out yet. Um, it's worrisome, but we know also that methane has been coming out of these seeps uh, at natural rates for, for millions and millions of years. So we don't know if it is, and if we are yet at the point of a much higher rate of methane, um, lo, uh, methane going into the atmosphere uh, than we would had historically. Um, once we really start to see that coming up, uh, it's going to be bad news indeed. Um, but there is, you know, there's already very bad news from the permafrost. Permafrost does seem to be uh, melting at a very rapid rate. And this also contains a huge amount of the stored carbon and indeed methane. Um, so we're already starting to get that into the atmosphere. Uh, and so if, uh, as we see things like, you know, 70 degree temperatures over Siberia and Alaska for large parts of the summer, uh, that's only going to accelerate. Um, so do, will this mean sort of uh, the end of life on Earth? Well, probably not. 
Um, you know, there have been ends of the world for the dominant species, uh, you know, since basically the Ordovician, there have been these mass extinctions. Um, and none of them has managed to completely extirpate life on Earth. Uh, with that said, will large complex animals like ourselves uh, be okay in surviving? Well, also probably not. Uh, but the super intelligent cockroaches of 50 million years from now may well thank us uh, for having wipe, wiped ourselves out, uh, much like we can thank the dinosaurs and these uh, proto mammals uh, for having been, been lost to mass extinction. And so with that, some things to think about uh, as part of this DEQ, uh, as we're thinking about environmental quality, and also just pouring one out for all, all our friends back in the Permian. All those poor suckers back in the Permian. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> they just didn't have what it takes, did they? To well, go I mean, through decades of lava flows and sulfur dioxide in the atmosphere. Yeah, oh, Lystrosaurus did. So, I mean, we can tr try to be like Lystrosaurus. We can try, we can try. Excellent stuff. That was really fun. No, thank you. To, in, a, in a sort of, you know, death sort of way <laughs> but but really fascinating stuff um i'm i'm impressed with how much we know about it mm -hmm. which uh maybe compared to other mass extinctions like the one that took out the dinosaurs we don't know as much what is the that relative comparative amount of information about all these different mass extinctions um there really has been there's been a real uptick in research intensity for the Permo-Triassic event, I'd say in the past 20 years, um, in part because it is the one that has the closest parallels to sort of current ecological crises. So it's, it's the last time in Earth history you basically go from a ice house Earth to the hot house Earth, which seems to be what's happening now. Like something like an asteroid striking the Earth and killing everything is not something that we can really prepare for. It's not something, it's, it's fascinating, don't get me wrong. And there's a lot of cool research being done on the extinction of the dinosaurs. But it's not something directly relevant to evaluating threats and rates and sort of like what we can do to save ourselves in the current day. Whereas the promo event, you know, has a lot more information on that. Um, so it's been, you know, in a more researchers have been interested in looking at it. It's been getting more funding uh, for studying that. And so it is, it's becoming better and better understood. All right, all right. I'm gonna go over here to the chat and see what folks are talking about. Yeah. Question for you. Did animals in the past have a more complex structure than animals do now? No, uh, in terms of the sort of complexity of the major groups like within vertebrates, uh, it's about the same. Um, so there are, you know, if you go back into the Permian, uh, they are, they're, the animals are less advanced in some ways, like they're mostly sprawling around on the ground. They're not like walking upright like we do, or like even a cow does. Um, there's less of them in the air, like there aren't any powered flight like you see in bats or birds or pterosaurs. Um, but just in terms of like their organ systems, their cells, probably their genomes, very similar to what's happening today, does not seem to have appreciably changed basically since the beginning of the Phanerozoic when animals diversify. You have to go back around a billion years before you get an earth that's just like single cell bacteria. Next one, how long did it take scientists to figure out that fossils came from animals and other living things? It was a, you know, it, it, it depends on sort of like what scholarly tradition you're working from. So like within the examples I gave are the ones that we have the, the best historical record of, which is within sort of like European scholarship. Um, and go, so you can go back to the 6th century BC and the Greek philosopher Xenophanes of Colophon uh, already recognized he saw fossil shells in Greece and thought, okay, these are at some point in the past, this was underwater if a sea snail is here on this mountain in Greece. So they had an idea of, you know, basically what fossils were, um, but didn't recognize that as an extinct species. Uh, if you go into other scholarly traditions, uh, you know, uh, some of the native peoples of Australia, Native Americans, 
uh, there is recognition of fossils as as being re representative of animals of some kind and possibly uh, forms that no longer exist uh, in the world. Um, but it is, you know, it's we don't have as good of a of a historical record of those those traditions, a lot of which were oral. Um, so it's harder to say exactly what they were thinking, what the fossils were. Interesting stuff. Okay, uh, let's see. Next one here. When the animals in the past went extinct, how did that affect their food chains to survive? It's a good yeah. question, right? Because there would be so many cascading effects from these yeah, catastrophic that's like, extinctions. That's actually something that I'm doing a lot of work with right now. So uh, in collaboration with colleagues at the Field Museum and the California Academy of Sciences, uh, they're looking at what are called keg graphs, which stands for uh, cascading extinctions uh, in geologic time. And so basically we're uh, looking at the food chains in before and after the extinction and seeing how much perturbation uh, the system will accept before everything collapses. Like if you remove half of the plants in an ecosystem, will that drive everything else to extinction? Um, and what we find is that, you know, the, uh, in the immediate sort of post-extinction period is it seems like uh, even the most basic primary production was lost. Like you're losing, and you actually see this in the fossil record too. So normally there's a lot of pollen in, uh, in fossil sediment indicating that there's a lot of plants around. Um, however, you see what's called a spore spike after mass extinctions. And this suggests that most of the vegetative life was fungus, which is growing on rotting things, dead things, or ferns, which are very good. They're pioneer species. Like after, a, am sure you've been seeing, uh, even with this summer's horrible wildfires out west, that when things start to come back, the first shoots that come up, it's often ferns. Uh, they're very good at you know, colonizing very degraded habitat. Um, so you're seeing all these ferns and fungus after the extinction. Um, the like the 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 large bodied animals also like they're mostly probably not being wiped out by just being hit by an asteroid or by being buried in lava it's because this they're smaller prey animals and uh, and plants are what are dying off first they don't have enough water they don't have the right you know amount of oxygen if they're animals um and their loss is what's what's driving the extinction of these larger things so yeah it is that the the cascade effect is is very real. All right, uh, Anne has a question. Can giant lava flows still happen? Yeah, uh, certainly. Um, <laughs> it, but it would be it, it's very protracted. So there is like you'll hear sometimes in the news all these worries about the Yellowstone supervolcano, uh, and do not worry about that. Uh, as <laughs> at least as okay, I mean, you compared to other things, compared to other aspects of environmental change, that is should be on the bottom of your list. Um, it's possible that it will happen. It is possible that an asteroid will strike the Earth and cause another mass extinction. But these are, it's such a vanishingly small uh, percent chance. Um, I mean, what is constantly happening is that there are changes in the tectonic makeup of the Earth, uh, sort of like the positions of plates. Um, there are upwellings from the mantle. Um, it is possible to get mantle plumes that could create sort of trappian volcanism. But again, they're super rare. Like in the history of complex life on Earth, there is only a handful of these, these traps events. Um, there is another one in the Cretaceous in the Deccan traps in India. Um, there are a few more going way back into uh, the Precambrian. Um, but yeah, there it's a at any given time, it's it's very unlikely to happen, and also it will take you know thousands of years for them to work up the steam to cover something as large as Siberia. So, uh, yeah, don't worry about that. <laughs> <laughs> Good to know. Good to know. Okay, uh, there's just a couple more here. After the runaway global warming, how did the climate restabilize? So it basically didn't. The Triassic was super hot and super arid for much of its time. And the animals that diversified there were ones that uh, were able to adapt to those changing climates. So like the, uh, the radiation of reptiles 
at that time, especially these these archosaurs, but also the squamates, so the lizards and the snakes. Um, it has been argued that the reason why they were relatively successful and these proto mammals uh, were not super successful is because you know uh, reptiles are better for dealing with arid climates. Um, they can you know they have impermeable scaly skin, so they're not losing moisture uh, to the heat and the dryness like we mammals are all the time. Um, obviously, there are mammals that specialize living in deserts today, things like camels or kangaroo rats, um, but they're really hyper specialized. They, you don't see the same diversity of mammals as you do reptiles in desert environments. Um, so there are, you know, there are a few little relict uh, humid zones, even in the Triassic, usually associated with mountain ranges and rift lakes. So another thing that's happening in the Triassic, and this is uh, it's like I said, there, it's, it's a complex history of this extinction. It's not all the volcano, even though that is, it's a big part of it, but also the continents are changing their positions. So you're going uh, to the Pangean state where all the continents form one supercontinent, Pangaea. Um, and as that's happening, you're getting this rifting. So continents tearing apart, coming together. And so around those boundaries, you do get some relatively cool, relatively wet areas. And so we think that's where things like these amphibians are starting to diversify. We think that's where or the proto mammals are diversifying. Uh, as a point of local interest, I will note that uh, where we are in uh, Research Triangle in North Carolina is part of what's called the Deep River Basin, which is one of these ancient rift basins from the Triassic. And so when you look at the fossils that you can find uh, around here, uh, you do see a lot of cynodonts and a lot of early amphibians. So it suggests that this was one of those, the, those wetter environments. If you look at Triassic rocks from out west, like all the stuff from Texas, New Mexico, Arizona, uh, it's mostly reptiles and there's very, very few proto mammals. So it suggests that that was part of the main sort of arid belt. Um, and it was a lot more, more desert or at least monsoonal type climate where it's arid part of the year and maybe has heavy rains uh, briefly during a wet season. All right. Do you have time for a couple more? Yeah, sure thing. Okay, excellent. Uh, Michelle's got some great questions here. I didn't want to miss them. How are you able to distinguish the difference between a fossil of an organism and a fossilized impression of an organism's teeth or a path, like with the shark-like one you presented? Yeah, sure thing. So we do find both. So there's, there are, there, and they're all considered fossils. So it doesn't have to be the original bone to be a fossil. Um, so you have like true mineralized elements. So that means like think of a bone or a tooth when it gets buried in the ground, uh, molecules of the surrounding rock filter into it through pores and replace whatever the, you know, the blood or the meat, uh, whatever's in there inside the marrow cavity with rock to create a fossil. Um, but you can also have over the course of millions of years, so let's say the, like a little hole on the edge of where that fossil is as erosion brings it towards the surface. Um, it can be like, you know, just a few millimeters hole on the edge there and rain gets in and all of a sudden the acid that is naturally in rain um, starts to dissolve that element. And so that in that case, you just get the empty space, that trace of where the fossil was. So that's called, that's called a mold. Uh, then let's say that that, you know, mudslide comes through, covers it up again. And so mud starts to go through that tiny hole and fill it. And so you get what is in no part the original fossil left, but it's a perfect, what we call a cast of the original fossil made by, in that case, it would be mudstone. We see that a lot actually. Uh, so they're, they're very common. They're also informative. Um, you know, we can't do things like histology on them or uh, like molecular paleontology uh, some of the more advanced modern techniques, but in terms of just telling us the shape of fossil animals, uh, still very useful. Um, really commonly seen in uh, fossil sea snails too. You often get what are called these stein kerns, which is basically just like the whirl of a snail shell gets filled with mud. The shell breaks off and is lost. And then you have that, that mud cast still in there. Um, you can find actually a lot of those fossils around here if you go looking. So I should, Keep I should get a shovel and head out back? Well, uh, I, 
<laughs> more more uh, probably local rivers you'll find mm -hmm. washing up on shore, but lots of stein currents out there. Nice. There you go, Michelle. All right, last one. How long did it take for the proto animals to evolve into something that is more recognizable to the animals we are familiar with today? Well, I mean, it depends. So from the like non-animals to animals, uh, that's all happening at the Cambrian explosion around 550 million years ago. And that happened over many, many millions of years. Um, so to go from single celled to complex multi-celled life, it seems there does, the, it, the rate increases quite a bit, which is why it's called the explosion at the beginning of the Cambrian, where you see all the modern phyla start to appear. But it's clear that there was like a long fuse of sort of vaguely wormy or jellyfishy creatures living in the, the end of the Precambrian, the so-called Ediacaran before that. Uh, if you're talking specifically about these, these groups that I mentioned in the Triassic, like these proto-mammals, these proto-like crocodiles, proto-frogs, uh, it seems like that was, it was fairly rapid after the extinction. So the, the Triassic's broken up into the, what we call the early Triassic, the middle Triassic, and the late Triassic. And the middle Triassic, you see stable ecosystems again, uh, even though it is, it's, it's hot, it's dry, but they are, it's not like post-apocalyptic like the early Triassic is. Um, but you see most of those groups already pretty diverse by that point. Uh, the early Triassic, it seems it's only a few million years long. And so a lot of this evolution was happening very rapidly, maybe within the span of a million years following the extinction. Um, and you can imagine like how incredible the selective pressures would have been in those extreme environments that may have like been leading animals. Okay, you gotta, you gotta find something that lets you survive or else you will die out. Excellent stuff. Christian, thanks so much. Yeah, you're welcome. Thanks so much for having me. Excellent presentation. Uh, people in the chat are sending their thanks as well for a great presentation. I'll remind everybody, uh, you can follow the museum. Do that. Follow the museum on social media. We're at Natural Sciences on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Visit naturalsciences.org and look at our virtual events page to see all of the great stuff that's happening coming to you live from the North Carolina Museum of Natural Sciences. Christian, if they wanted to follow your work and research, how can folks do that? Um, well, uh, you know, following the museum, certainly a great way, but also uh, you can follow me on Twitter. Uh, I'm at Synapsida, uh, S-Y-N-A-P-S-I-D-A. -S Perfect, excellent. They can, they can keep track of the uh, Jurassic World cynodont debacle. Yeah, uh, uh, upcoming Dysinodon <laughs> uh, action. Uh, I'm sure, you know, I've actually never seen a Jurassic World movie, uh, but if there's one way to get me to watch, it is, it's by adding Dysinodon. So <laughs> they've got my number. Oh, I'll have to have you back on. We'll, we'll, we'll have a watch party. We'll do the whole Jurassic oh, World thing. And then that's a great we'll idea. have a debrief. <laughs> we should, we're going to make note of that. All, All right. right. Behind the scenes, we're gonna, we should do that. That sounds great. All right, everybody, thanks for tuning in. Christian, thanks again. Uh, enjoy the rest of your Wednesday, folks. We'll see you again here next Wednesday at noon for the Lunchtime Discovery Series. Bye, everybody. <laughs>